2021. I uh, hope you had a great, if I've not seen you, before, seen you since the new year, hope you had a great holiday season uh, and are off to a, a prosperous uh, new year. I am uh, John Kimbrell. I'm the Chief Business Affairs Officers for, for One Spartanburg. And let me just say thank you for uh, tuning in to this uh, very important and timely caffeinated conversations. As, as you know, uh, we do this on a monthly basis and try to find uh, some great topics uh, for you and your business, uh, especially uh, during these times. And so we're certainly uh, glad to have uh, Dr. Jane Kelly uh, from our Department of Health and Environmental uh, Control, First Day of South Carolina, and we'll get to her uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we do, I want to make sure we do some housekeeping items, and, and then I want to make sure I get a proper thank you to uh, our sponsors that make caffeinated conversations uh, available to you uh, each month. You see on the screen there are Wells Fargo. Uh, Ethan Burroughs is with us today. I want to uh, thank Ethan for his support of not just caffeinated conversations from a, from a financial, but also from his support uh, Wells Fargo does for One Spartanburg uh, every day and every month. And so Ethan, thank you for your investment uh, with us and, and your support of One Spartanburg. I want to offer uh, some time for you today if you want to uh, tell the tell the audience uh, about Wells Fargo about yourself um, that'd be great. Hey good morning John thank you so much for that great introduction we certainly are very proud to be able to support um, Spartanburg Chamber of One Spartanburg Inc as well as the caffeinated conversations program geared to supporting our small business and you know certainly 2020 was a very difficult year for a lot of our small business customers and much like you we were impacted as well um, i did want to give just a few information about the the ppp loan program both the first round and second round um, we were proud to serve more than 194,000 customers uh, last year through the paycheck protection program 84% um, of those customers had fewer than 10 employees and our average loan amount was $54,000, which was the lowest among the participating large banks. And this just shows our commitment to helping small businesses in need. We've also contributed over $4 million in the PPP loan fees that we earned to our one uh, to our open for business fund that Wells Fargo has started that provides grants to nonprofit organizations that support small businesses facing the COVID-19 challenges, especially those that work with minority owned small businesses. And of course, the, earlier this week, we opened up the second round of the PPP loan uh, fund for clients to, uh, to apply. And so, you know, we're certainly looking forward to getting past the virus in 2021. We're very excited about the work that's been done with the vaccine and for our speaker today to kind of give us some little bit more information on that because I think that's our best our best opportunity to really uh, knock out uh, this virus and us us and everyone included to get back to work. So John thank you so much and thank you for everybody that's joining us this morning. All right thank you Ethan. Uh, Ethan mentioned uh, the PPP um, uh, loan that Wells Fargo is actively uh, helping their customers um, with. Let me encourage you, as you know, everyone on this call probably knows that about 10 months ago when, when COVID-19 uh, hit us, uh, hit obviously our, our country, our world, and uh, of course our community, uh, one spot where went to work and, and, and started our bringing back the bird business recovery efforts uh, launched last May. If you have not done so, everything Ethan talked about uh, is located on our dedicated website, uh, bringingbackthebird.com. I encourage you to, to visit that site and, and see all the information, all the resources that we put together uh, for our business community in Spartanburg, whether it's PPP, whether it's a small business loan through us, uh, whether it's information about the vaccine, everything is located on that site. So if you have any questions from today's meeting um, that you wanna have additional answers to, I uh, encourage you to, to go to that uh, site. So, Ethan, thank you for your support uh, and your comments this morning. Also, want to thank uh, Regenesis Healthcare, uh, that's a major sponsor of caffeinated conversations 
uh, as well over the last uh, few months. So thank you for, for that as well. A uh, couple other housekeeping things. Uh, this, this session today is, is going to be, a, I think, a presentation format, but we want to make sure that all your questions are answered. Uh, so, of course, the chat button uh, that you are very well familiar with now. Uh, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Kelly today, just put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, if we have time at the end, we'll also have time to, uh, you can ask your questions uh, through, uh, through, the, through the mute button. So unmute that at the appropriate time and we will uh, get to as many questions as time allow. Uh, we'll we'll go, to, go to around 10 o'clock if we need to. Uh, or a little before 10, but we want to make sure all your questions are answered. This session is being recorded uh, this morning, so if you want to pass this information along to anyone uh, in your office or anyone in your family, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, we had Dr. Kelly with us at our Bringing Back the Berg uh, Task Force meeting in November. Uh, at that time, uh, we didn't know a lot about uh, vaccine quantity, vaccine distribution. So Dr. Kelly spoke to the group uh, about the safety and the effectiveness of vaccine. Uh, as Ethan mentioned to you earlier, uh, we, we believe and we know that the, the biggest path, the, the path out of this pandemic is through the vaccine. Uh, it's very important that, that our, our members in the business community know about it, know its safety and its effectiveness. And so we've invited Dr. Kelly from uh, DHEC back today uh, to join us. Uh, I think she's on. I think she had a meeting at early this morning. There she is, early this morning. I know you were incredibly busy, Dr. Kelly, so we certainly uh, thank you for carving out some, some of your time today to tell our Spartanburg uh, businesses about uh, the vaccine, um, what, you, what all you know about it, you know a lot about it, and also uh, answer their questions that they may have, because as we talked about a few months ago, it's very important that that we know that, that the business community and everybody knows that it's safe and we encourage them uh, when it's their time uh, to take uh, the vaccine. So thank you for joining us today. You've got an incredible bio. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of that, uh, but yeah. just you are very well versed and very well qualified to speak on this topic. And we certainly appreciate, first of all, your leadership during this important time and uh, thank you for joining us today. So I'll turn the program over to you, uh, and we have questions throughout. At the end, we've been, you can field those as well. So thanks for joining us. That's great. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and I know I've spoken to this group before, and some of these slides are going to be a repeat, but I think it's a, an important message, understanding some of the, the background of how this vaccine, the, these vaccines were developed and understanding the biology of COVID-19. This is a map I pulled from the CDC website. This is showing the average daily cases of people of COVID-19 infections per 100,000 in the last seven days. And the darker blue colors are mean a higher number. South Carolina is exceeded only by California and Arizona right now. South Carolina, for a long time, we had a relatively low rate of cases per 100,000 people. It's changed. We have a, a surge in cases, and unfortunately, I fear that that's going to be followed by a surge in deaths. And it varies a little bit geographically, but every area of South Carolina is on the increase. You'll note that the in this slide showing uh, cases over the past, you know, this is sort of a seven day moving average. So not looking at daily cases, but weekly cases. And you can see that blip in July, but look at the surge that is going on right now. And unfortunately, the upstate is the area that is seeing the greatest surge in COVID-19 cases. And it's not just about cases, it's also about deaths. And this is the um, weekly reported number of COVID-19 deaths. Again, there is a surge going on right now that is comparable to that surge that we saw in July. I fear it's going to be higher than that surge in July because remember, the rise in deaths is delayed by maybe two or more weeks after the rise in cases. And there's a reporting delay. So that last bar that looks like, oh, it's a little bit lower, that's good. No, that just reflects reporting delay. So I just want people to appreciate the seriousness of this, that we've been dealing with COVID-19 in South Carolina for a long time, but this is the highest surge we have had in deaths and cases. All right, now that I have your attention, 
I'm going to give a brief overview. Some of this is going to be repeat from what went on before, but I think it's important to have a refresher understanding about the virus and the disease, as well as that those questions about how can new vaccines be created so quickly? Uh, how could they be safe? Because I'm not here today to tell you they are safe and effective. I'm here to give you information so you can make your own judgment call around vaccine. Also want to talk a little bit about side effects, the new virus variants you may have read about, and finish with a discussion of masks. Do masks really work? What do we know about that? A lot of terminology that sometimes gets used interchangeably. Coronaviruses is the name of the general group of viruses. Uh, some of the coronaviruses in the past were SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. This is a very closely related virus. It's 96% genetically the same. It, so it's named, and that's reflected in its name. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. And Coronavirus Disease 2019, or COVID-19, that's the name of the disease. I'm giving you this little bit of background biology because I think it is important to understand how vaccines work so that you can make your own judgment call about receiving vaccine. And we have some new vaccines on the horizon that work in a little bit different way. So uh, as we get to the point where one might have a choice in which vaccine to receive, it will be helpful to understand them. The little cartoon shows what the virus looks like under a microscope. The squiggly line in the center is the genetic code, the gene for making more virus. It's RNA, which is a little different from our genetic code, which is DNA. That's important because I hear people ask, is this vaccine gonna change my genetic code? No, it is not DNA and it does, the vaccine do, does not contain whole virus or live or attenuated, weakened or inactivated virus. It only has the gene to the spike protein. That protein is the thing that sticks to the surface of the cell and lets the virus into the cell. It's almost like a key in a lock to inject the virus into the cell. Many people who catch COVID-19 have mild symptoms. Some have no symptoms at all. They can be asymptomatic and yet contagious. But many people have mild symptoms that look a lot like the flu. It's tough to distinguish it from influenza. Fever, fatigue, cough, aching all over. But some people have more serious signs, such as shortness of breath, which I would not expect with most people for influenza. And unfortunately, some people get this severe COVID-19 that can affect any part of your body, not just pneumonia. It can also give you heart damage, kidney damage, affect your liver, your gut, your brain, and it can transmit from mother to fetus in a pregnant woman. Unfortunately, we have seen cases of pregnant women with COVID-19 who have had stillbirths or who have had an early delivery. We still don't know enough about how it may affect the unborn child because this is still a new disease. We are seeing cases in South Carolina of something that used to be thought to be a rare event with severe disease in children. This is a multi-system inflammation where you get inflammation of many different things in the body. Most importantly though, what I put in, uh, the, in red are some of the obvious signs and symptoms, conjunctivitis and swollen lymph nodes. But more importantly, almost 100% of kids who get this severe complication have heart disease. The left ventricle, which is the pumping part of your heart, doesn't work right. And the concern is that that may be a long-term symptom, that even if they survive this severe complication, that they may be left with chronic disease. All right, let's move to talking about vaccine. We've got two vaccines now that have been authorized for emergency use, and I'll discuss them, but we do, I want to emphasize, have some other vaccines that I think that we're going to see authorized in the coming months. This cartoon I find helpful in trying to explain to people how do vaccines work. Vaccines work by providing a sneak preview. For example, we've got a wanted poster here that shows what the virus looks like. And the idea is that when the green spiky virus arrives, the white blood cells say, wait a minute, I've seen this before, and they can react right away. There are a lot of different ways to make a vaccine, and I'm not going to go through all the biology here, except to point out that the, the technology being used for these two virus vaccines that are available now, that using RNA, 
is actually not a brand new technology. This may be the first time we're hearing about being used in vaccines, but it's not new technology. Vaccine developers have been working with this technology for years. That, that's a typo, that should say years with a plural. And this is a complicated slide. I only put it up there because I know for people who are not biologists or medical people, maybe the first time they've heard of this messenger RNA. What is that? I, I don't trust that. It sounds, uh, you know, sounds too space age. I want to point out messenger RNA was discovered in 1961, and they've been using it for years as anti-cancer response for uh, it in the late 90s. It's been used in, as a medication. It's been used in what's called immunotherapy, stimulating your immune system to react to destroy cancer cells. That's been going on for more than 10 years. And it, starting in 2012, they started doing studies with other uh, infectious diseases, such as influenza and respiratory syncytial virus. That's a, a virus that causes lung disease in children. They've been working on an mRNA vaccine for those things for almost 10 years. It's just they haven't been successful in creating a stable vaccine until this past year. Let's talk a little bit about vaccine development. The longest stage in vaccine development is basic research, the preclinical stuff, the science part of it. When I hear people say, mm, Operation Warp Speed, I, I don't trust this, it's been, it's been developed too fast, how could, they, how could they do this so quickly? I want to remind people about SARS, remember severe acute respiratory syndrome in 2003? They started work on a vaccine in 2003. We have 17 years of preclinical experience. That's the biggest step in basic research. Only after you do that basic research do you start to go into these phase one, two, and three studies. Phase one, you give it to a small number of people, maybe 50 people, just to look for safety, young, healthy people. They were able to put, use those 17 years of preclinical experience to good use so that when the genetic code, the genome for this virus was published in January, they were able to get vaccine into animals, into rodents and to monkeys in February of this year and into humans in March with phase one studies. Phase two, you test it on several hundred people to do further safety checks. And if things are looking good, you go into phase three. Now, normally, the second longest stage besides manufacturing in development of a vaccine is that phase three study because studying vaccine in humans is expensive. Vaccine companies don't want to give enroll thousands and tens of thousands of people right away into vaccine trial unless they know they've got a sure thing. So they usually will enroll a few hundred people. If it's looking good, they'll do a few more. If it's looking good, they'll do a few more. What's different here is both Pfizer and Moderna and other vaccine companies that we can talk about in the future, they enrolled te literally tens of thousands of people in their phase three studies in a matter of months, sometimes as short as two months. That's an expensive proposal. Maybe let's, let's think about this, that phase three study, there were no steps skipped. They enrolled, both Pfizer and Moderna, enrolled more than 30,000 people into their vaccine studies. What's different is because they had funding support from the federal government and international support, they went ahead and did that within two months. They started these vaccine trials in phase three starting in June of 2020. So we've got more than six months worth of information. And that's, that, that doesn't sound like a long period of time, but in normal vaccine studies, usually you'll go for an FDA approval after you have six months worth of safety data. So no, no steps were skipped. The longest step was that basic research and the, the phase three study was sped up in the sense that they recruited more people quickly, but they didn't skip any steps with safety and efficacy. So uh, this just is reiterating what I'm saying. Basically, when SARS-CoV-2 appeared, the vaccine companies knew where they wanted to focus. And in fact, the fact that all of them all of the companies is seeking authorization in the United States have focused on the gene for the spike protein. The fact that they all did that, I think lends support to the idea that they knew from basic science where they wanted to go. So what is that science of what they did? They take the messenger RNA, messenger is an important word. It just carries the message, make more spike protein. These vaccines, they take 
that messenger RNA for the spike protein. But if they just injected it directly, enzymes in your body would, would destroy it. It would never get a chance to get into the cell. So they also had to coat it with a lipid, a fat, an oil, and I'll go through the ingredients in a moment, so that it doesn't get destroyed right away. It gets injected into muscle, certain cells in your body, immune system cells, take that up, they start making some spike protein and putting it, sticking it to the surface of those cells so that other immune systems will make antibodies to it. It's more complicated than that. It's not just antibodies. There are other T cells, killer cells. But the point is that this vaccine cannot give you COVID-19. It doesn't have the whole virus, doesn't have the instructions for the whole virus, just for that spike protein. The Pfizer vaccine, though this is true for Moderna as well, but just to go through one of them, the Pfizer vaccine was studied in 150 different phase three trial sites in six different countries, including 39 US states, enrolled more than 40,000 participants. And this slide was taken from November. Actually, it's more than 45,000 participants have had their second vaccination to date. And the study included often vaccine and medication studies are done on a, just a group of healthy white men. But I think both Pfizer and Moderna knew that it was important that they have a wide range of ages. So Pfizer vaccine was tested in people aged 16 through 85. They also knew that it was going to be important to study it in people with multiple chronic medical conditions. So they included people with diabetes, people with what are called autoimmune diseases like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and they had a variety of uh, racial and ethnic groups participating as well. I think that is important in understanding, the, you know, answering the question, was this vaccine tested for safety? Did it work in, in people who look like me, people who have a medical condition like I do? I'm going to talk in a moment about uh, safety and efficacy, you know, effectiveness, and what do we know statistically. But I know an important question is this vaccine, these vaccines are still new. What do we know about rare or long term side effects? Because the truth is, until you vaccinate millions and millions of people, you might not find that one in a million uh, rare event. So far in the United States, 10 and a half million people have been vaccinated. I don't know what the numbers are worldwide, but remember these vaccines are being administered in other countries as well. We have an excellent system of active safety monitoring in the United States. This is, goes on beyond what we normally do for monitoring safety. It, uh, there is a system where they, um, when you are vaccinated, you are given the opportunity to receive a daily uh, phone text or an email asking you, how are you feeling? Are you experiencing any symptoms? That goes on daily for one week and then weekly for six more weeks, looking for those side effects that we don't want to rely on people just spontaneously reporting something or a physician spontaneously reporting something. Uh, CDC and FDA are looking actively for any rare or long-term side effects. So far, nothing other than some allergic reactions, and talk about, about that in a second, other, nothing has emerged other than those allergic reactions. So when, you know, everything in life is a choice. Each of us must weigh our own benefits and risks when we consider whether you want to receive vaccine. So what's the benefit of the vaccine? Well, both Pfizer and Moderna are 95% effective in preventing symptomatic disease and almost 100% effective in preventing severe disease. That's about as good as it gets. That, that most vaccines are nowhere near as effective as that. So that, that is good news. What are the risks? Well, there are temporary symptoms. Not everybody experiences them, but most people have mild to moderate it, it, symptoms after they receive the vaccine. A sore arm, maybe some fever, aching all over, feeling fatigued, for, but that's for a day or two. This is not long lasting. Each of us has to weigh, how do we feel about 95% affection, uh, protection versus the risk of those temp temporary symptoms and the possible unknown rare you might be that one in a million person who has a rare side effect. But you also have to weigh what's your risk of getting COVID and if you got infected, what's your risk of severe disease or even death? This statistic has been true for the past month. This slide refers to the week of December 17th, but it's been true every week since then. COVID-19 has been the number one weekly cause of death in South Carolina for the past month. 
the number one cause of death, outstripping heart disease, cancer, stroke, all these other chronic diseases. And it's not, uh, it's not an equal opportunity infection. Your risk of severe disease and death increases with age, but also with chronic medical conditions. So if you have high blood pressure or hypertension, you have a three times increased chance of hospitalization from COVID-19. These conditions listed here, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease, uh, these are very common conditions. We have a, a, you know, a large number of people in South Carolina who are living with one or more of these conditions, and they have that much increased risk of hospitalization. Let's focus a little bit on the two vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. They're the two companies that make the vaccines that are authorized for use now. They're actually very sim similar. They both use the messenger RNA for the spike protein. And no surprise that their effectiveness should be about the same as well, 95% effective after two doses. And that's very important. They're about 50% effective after that first dose. And that's why it's so important that people continue to wear a mask, maintain physical distance, avoid crowded set indoor settings, because even after that first dose, you're only about 50% affected and uh, it, protected, and we're not certain how long that protection lasts. 95% effective after that second dose. So that's really good news. And no serious safety concerns have emerged. Mild to moderate symptoms, as I mentioned, we started receiving the Pfizer vaccine in South Carolina, December 14th, and we started receiving Moderna, December 28th. The Pfizer vaccine is the one you may have heard about, has to be kept at this super cold temperature. That's because that messenger RNA breaks down quickly. So when I hear people say, oh, I don't know, I don't want messenger RNA in my cells. I mean, isn't that going to affect me forever? No, messenger RNA gets broken down by enzymes very quickly. That's why it's been tricky to make this vaccine. It does not last long in your cells. It lasts long enough to make some spike protein to stimulate your immune system. The Moderna vaccine. Moderna is, is a small company that has done a lot of work with messenger RNA for different platforms, meaning for, you know, for different uses, like I mentioned for cancer immune, immunotherapy, for stimulating your immune system to attack cancer cells. So they've got a little better secret sauce. You can, uh, whatever their ingredient is in their uh, chemicals in that lipid, they've got it so that you can store that vaccine at normal freezer temperatures. In South Carolina, Pfizer vaccine has initially gone to healthcare settings, to hospitals, to urgent care settings, to uh, pharmacies and to doctor's offices uh, for uh, administration first to workers in healthcare settings. The Moderna vaccine we are administering first to people, to both residents and staff in nursing homes. Once everyone in those settings who has been vaccinated, who wants to be vaccinated, then Moderna vaccine will be available to the general public as well. Right now we have over 12 1,200 different sites around the state, urgent care, uh, small clinics, um, neighborhood pharmacies, you know, not just uh, CVS and Walgreens, but many of the pharmacies, at, for example, at Ingalls uh, and, and other settings, are right now enrolled in our vaccine program and are able to administer vaccine, we just have very limited amounts as yet. So it's not out there in all those settings. But once we, ha as we get more vaccine, we start opening up more sites for administering that vaccine. People have asked me, what, are, what is in this vaccine? And I, again, the active ingredient is messenger RNA, that genetic code. But what else is in the vaccines? This is for Pfizer. Moderna is very similar. Both Pfizer and Moderna have oils, salts, and sugars. The four oils in Pfizer include something called polyethylene glycol, and that's in the Moderna vaccine as well. And it, it, its purpose is to keep those enzymes from breaking it down. But this is the ingredient that is most likely to cause that sore arm. I mean, imagine being injected with an oil in your arm. You know, your body reacts against that saying, you know, and causing that discomfort. But polyethylene glycol, though that's a long chemical name, it's commonly used in over-the-counter laxatives. Uh, it's used in bowel preparation for colonoscopy. It's the one that's most likely to cause symptoms or allergic reaction. But people who are allergic to polyethylene glycol usually know it. 
The other ingredients, there are four salts, including you know common table salt, sodium chloride, and that's just what's called a pH buffer. It's just to make sure it's not too acidic. Um, and a sugar to keep the vaccine particles from sticking together. That's it. There's no mercury, there are no adjuvants, antibiotics, or preservatives in these vaccines. I keep mentioning these symptoms because I think it's important for people to know ahead of time that they may get, get some possible local or systemic, meaning total body like fatigue symptoms so that they're not surprised. But I think it would be a tragedy if a person got their first dose of vaccine and then didn't come back for the second one because they said, oh, you know, I felt tired all over. You know, I didn't feel well. I don't want to get that second one. Because number one, they're not protected. They're only 50% protected and we don't know for how long. You really need to get that second dose. And also, it would be a waste of a vaccine to give some, right now we have a, a really limited, scarce resource. It would be a shame to waste a single dose of vaccine. And those symptoms are a sign that the vaccine is working. It's a sign that your immune system is responding. So to put it in perspective, 10 and a half million doses of vaccine have been administered. About one in every 100,000 doses have induced a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. To, in comparison, about one in every 5,000 doses of penicillin produces a severe allergic reaction. So yes, one in 100,000, know, there are people who are getting these severe allergic reactions, but they're treatable. They're treatable with some epinephrine, they're treatable with antihistamines. You get your vaccine in a pharmacy or urgent care or hospital setting, doctor's office, they have these treatments readily available. There has been one report of a serious autoimmune reaction. It was a blood clotting disorder called ITP. It has to do with your platelets. It, it, this occurred in a physician in Florida two weeks after he received his vaccine. It may or may not be related. I mean, some people get this autoimmune reaction, uh, you know, just spontaneously. So CDC and FDA are investigating that further. In contrast, over 400,000 people have died in the U.S. with COVID-19. So whether to get vaccinated is a personal decision. No one's going to require vaccination. You just need to weigh your personal risks and benefits. I want to talk a little bit about vaccine allocations in South Carolina. I took this screenshot yesterday. I know that today, Thursdays, we receive new allocations. So I know all these numbers have changed if you go to our website. But, uh, but as of yesterday, South Carolina had received over 300,000 doses of vaccine. Uh, 172,000 had been administered. Um, part of that is in via the Pfizer program, and part of it's via Moderna. Moderna is handled by CVS and Walgreens going to long-term care facilities. That's not under DHEC control, that's a federal program con with those pharmacies. But if we focus at what is DHEC doing, and we look at the Pfizer vaccine, we've had over 2,000 doses received, 74% of them are in arms. You'll notice in that lower left corner where it says appointments scheduled, we've got more appointments than we have vaccine available. And I know that that has been a problem. We are relying on weekly new allocations of vaccine. We normally receive about 60,000 doses of vaccine weekly. Uh, we've been told that we will continue to have 60,000 doses split roughly between Pfizer and Moderna each week uh, through the end of January. After that, we don't know. It depends upon manufacturing. I'm a, the Pfizer and Moderna manufacturing companies are making vaccine as quickly as they can, and then it gets distributed nationwide. So I, uh, we are acutely aware that there's a, short of a uh, shortage of vaccine. People are frustrated trying to make appointments uh, to receive vaccine, and we are working on a system. Uh, to improve our system for um, uh, applying, making an appointment to receive vaccine. I want to focus now a little bit on these new variants of vaccine and talk about what we know and what we don't know. What we know is that RNA viruses like SARS-CoV-2, they frequently mutate. What a mutation means is that they change out one of the letters in that genetic code. And sometimes uh, they can change a letter in that genetic code and it doesn't make any difference at all. So not all mut mutations, sounds like a really scary word, not all mutations are important. There is a new variant that has emerged in the United Kingdom and it's called B117. 
and it appears to spread more easily. And we have seen that variant in the United States, but there's no evidence that it's a worse variant other than it's spreading more easily. It's not causing increased severity of disease or increased hospitalizations or increases in death, but we are watching to see how quickly it spreads. That's a very worrisome thing. There are also new variants emerging in South Africa and Brazil, but we haven't found them in the United States yet. There is a program at CDC and within South Carolina where they randomly sample viruses to look at their genetic sequencing, their genome sequencing, to look specifically for these variants and for other new mutations. Both the British and South African variants are associated with a higher number of virus particles. That's also called your viral load in your upper respiratory tract. That's why we think they're more contagious and they spread more easily. The B117 may be more widespread than this map shows, but this is where we know that uh, lineage, that variant has shown up. So it's right next door in Georgia. It's probably just a matter of time that we'll start seeing this in South Carolina as well. What about what we don't know? What we don't know is whether these new variants might not respond the same way to the medications like the remdesivir that we use in people in the hospital or to the passive monoclonal antibodies. That's a, an IV infusion that if you are infected very early on in your infection, they can give you extra antibodies. We don't know whether those extra antibodies will work as well in these new variants. They're studying that right now. There's also some concern that some of the tests might not detect these new variants. Now, most of the PCR tests, those are like the nasal swab, oral swab, saliva tests. Those are the ones that you don't get a rapid answer. They have to go off to the lab. Those tests look at multiple different targets to find the virus. So, you know, even if you have a mutation that impacts one, the other uh, targets of that test will find it. Some of the rapid tests, though, the ones where you can get an answer in 15 minutes, we don't know if they're going to work as well in these new variants. That's being studied right now. We have no evidence that the current vaccines would not protect against the uh, British variant. Uh, there is a little bit of concern about the South African variant because it has more mutations. So they are studying that right now. And in fact, that last bullet that vaccine companies are testing, that is still true, but Pfizer just came out with an announcement that they have tested their vaccine against these new variants uh, and, and the uh, vaccine has been effective against these new variants. Still, the concern is if you've got a new variant that could spread more easily, even though it's not associated with an increased number of deaths, if more people get it, there are going to be more deaths. You know, we have new cases are the highest ever and rising. You saw South Carolina for a long time, we were relatively lower compared to the rest of the country. Now we're at, we're number three in terms of number of new cases per 100,000 and the number of deaths unfortunately, is likely to follow in the next few weeks. Our healthcare systems are at or near capacity. Again, we were not in the same situation as, for example, New York in the beginning of this, or you know, the Midwest, uh, or North and South Dakota more recently. But we are sneaking up to that uh, it, that loss of capacity. We are beginning to uh, approach being at or near capacity. So the fact that these new variants are emerging that spread more easily means we need to tighten down uh, even more than before on mitigation measures around wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, avoiding crowds. I know everybody's sick of this message, but this is the most critical time in this pandemic to be doing that. I mean, we've got vaccines are arriving, and yet if we uh, loosen our, our grip on maintaining these mitigation measures, um, it's going to be very difficult, even with vaccine, to keep this pandemic from getting worse. I do want to finish with a couple of words about masks and then we'll have time for questions. Um, I, I know there was a lot of confusion in the beginning of this year. Do masks work? Don't they work? I think that we now have a tremendous amount of evidence, both epidemiologic evidence, you know, looking at where have there been outbreaks and where were they able to suppress outbreaks based on who was wearing masks or mask 
um, mandates. Uh, we also have a lot of biological information. Nothing in life is 100%. Masks by themselves are not going to do it. That's why it's also important to maintain distance and to avoid crowded indoor settings. But there's also a difference in effectiveness in the type of mask. A, a mask needs to be well fitting so that you don't have gaps across your nose or at, at your cheeks. It needs to go under your chin, over your nose. And a two or more layer mask is more important than ever. And it's not just a physical blockage. Yes, the physical, you know, first layer will stop droplets, stop aerosol. But of course, viral, viral particles are smaller than the weave in that mask. Of course, some of them get through to that second layer. The reason the second layer is important important is not just mechanical. It is also electrostatic filtration. Have you ever walked across a, you know, a carpeted floor in the winter, the air is really dry, and then you touch something metallic and you get that little shock, that little electrical shock? That's what I mean by electrostatic forces. If you have a cloth mask made of two different materials, maybe cotton and silk, uh, or could be ideal, cotton and nylon. It creates this electrostatic charge, and that is hydrophobic, meaning it, it, it resists moisture. And that is an opportunity to stop the virus, not just by mechanical filtration, but also because it makes a surface kind of sticky for virus. All right, do masks really work? I'm gonna just tell two stories and then we can take some questions. Uh, this is a story of uh, close contact and intense physical activity at a sporting event. So these were players in a in recreational ice hockey game. They didn't wear masks while playing the game. One person was an asymptomatic, contagious carrier, didn't know until the next day when he became sick and be, was tested and word was given out to the rest of the players that they had been exposed while playing hockey. So, you know, they're, they're, it, you know, it, it varies the amount of time individuals sped, spent in close contact with this individual, but everybody was breathing hard. So of those who were tested, 14 of 22 players developed COVID-19 after that game, just be, because of that recreational exposure. I wanna tell a positive story though, and I think this is the one that tells it the best. Two hairstylists who, again, had pre-symptomatic COVID-19. They didn't know they had the virus, but they were very careful in their practice. They each wore masks and they required that all their clients wear masks. Now, you know these people are standing within six feet of each other and they're indoors. And you know that they're talking for at least 15 minutes with each of these people, and yet, the next day when these two hairstylists were tested, discovered they had COVID-19, they contacted their clients, they all got tested. Not a single one of those clients contracted COVID-19. Masks work. I've, I've included my email on this last slide in case anybody wants to eat, thinks of a question later and wants to email me a question. I, and otherwise, I'd be glad to take questions now. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Hey, thank you, Dr. Kelly, uh, for your time and your and all the great information. Got about ten minutes if we if we need it. Uh, I've got a couple of questions that just some clarification from your from your presentation. But does anybody have any questions you want to ask Dr. Kelly? Uh, I didn't have any in the chat. Uh, now's the time. Well, I'll kick it off. Just a couple of things. Back on your first slide, you had the the graph of the new cases, and I, I watch a lot of the. Reports. So we're not we're not at a peak yet. I mean, I think nationally there's been some talk about peaking and through the holiday surge. Where South Carolina is not at that point. We are worried that it's going to continue to increase. Okay. Yeah, I, I you know I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, and I don't want to be communicating a message of hopelessness. It, there are things we can do about this. South Carolina really battened down the hatches previously and brought our numbers under control. Right? I mean, we had a big surge after uh, Fourth of July weekend, but it, then it came down. It, it's more difficult now because we're indoors. Uh, the holiday season, uh, people got together. People thought, well, it's just one day. I really want to see family. I really want to travel. We're still seeing the effects of that, but we've done this before. It's harder now because we're indoors and it's cold, so we're not you know, meeting people outdoors as much. But indoors is tougher for a couple of reasons. You've got dry air from heat indoors and virus can hang in the air longer from that dry heat. 
Um, and you know, as much as possible, if you're going to meet with friends, meet with them outdoors. You know, I, I still see friends. I go for a walk with my dog outside. Um, and I, I think that's a really key message. It's, it's not hopeless, but people need to realize, yeah, we're gonna see, we are likely to see an increase. We are not at the top of that curve yet. Got a couple of questions that are coming in now. One of them is the first and second vaccine shots, are they exactly the same dosage and ingredients? Oh gosh, I'm so glad you asked that. I should have mentioned that. If you're going when you get the vaccine, it's critically important that you get the same vaccine. So if you start with Pfizer, your second dose has to be with Pfizer. It's a booster. So it's got to be with the same manufacturing company. For both Pfizer and Moderna, it is the same dose for each of them. I mean, same, you know, you start with Pfizer, the first dose and the second dose are the same. Uh, same ingredients, same amount of vaccine. Right. How do the demographics affect likelihood of people choosing to take the vaccine? What we have seen so far in South Carolina, and I believe this is true nationally as well, is that there's been a lot of vaccine hesitancy among people of color, African Americans, Hispanic Latinos, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and I think there are complicated reasons for that. Uh, some of it is historical, uh, that there have been egregious you know, shameful events, unethical events around medication, the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, that have happened in the past. And I know that there continues to be concern about not only, gee, these vaccines were developed so quickly, I'm not sure I trust them, but also just vaccine hesitancy in general in the African-American community because there's medical mistrust. There is mistrust of the government. Uh, there's mistrust of vaccine companies, there's mistrust sometimes even of uh, healthcare providers. I've often heard people say, I trust my doctor, but doctors in general, the system in general, I'm not so sure. And that's why my message to you is not, believe me, it's safe and effective. It's do your own homework. N you know, look at the statistics, decide for yourself. Ten and a half million people in this country have received these vaccines. What do you know about that? You know, how, how many bad effects have there been? Who is receiving vaccine? You know, there are uh, leaders in different communities of color who have received vaccine. Dr. Bell, our state epidemiologist, African-American woman, she has received the vaccine and was photographed publicly. So I think I, I understand there's plenty of reasons to be skeptical based on uh, history and on some current events. But look for yourself, find trusted information sources and make a decision for yourself. A lot of questions are coming in now, so let me get through a couple of these. Um, sure. Uh, should people with sulfa allergies be concerned about the vaccine? No, there's no sulfa in these in either one of these vaccines. No antibiotics at all, and no sulfa. Uh, and then a couple of questions about the distribution and phases. Um, uh, if that, as vaccine quantity shipped to South Carolina increases, are there any changes likely in the phases of people who are eligible for the vaccine? And and where do teachers fall? We're currently in phase 1A, which is uh, workers in healthcare settings, uh, people 70 and older, because they have the highest mortality rate uh, by age and in long-term care facilities, residents and staff. We don't have to completely finish 1A before we move to 1B, uh, but right now we've got such limited quantities of vaccine, we're still in 1A. 1B would include teachers, it would include uh, frontline essential workers. By that, I mean not just essential workers like in the Homeland Security definition, uh, which is you know, almost every industry, but rather frontline, meaning the people who are the front face working with the public who have an increased risk of, uh, of, cont of catching the virus, um, as well as people who live or work in congregate settings, such as uh, group homes or uh, people who are in manufacturing plants that can't avoid uh, overcrowded settings like meat packing plants where we have seen outbreaks of COVID-19. Phase 1C is going to be probably several months down the line uh, unless we get a great increase in vaccine, which is possible if those other vaccines become approved and available. We may be able to move more quickly into phase 1C, which would include people age 16 and up who have chronic medical conditions. Okay. Uh, here's a question that I think that, that I've asked, I've wanted to know too, but somebody asked it. So if you've tested positive for COVID-19, 
do you have antibodies that would not require a vaccine? So, okay. so I've heard some misinformation that if you, if you have antibodies, you shouldn't take the vaccine. What's your opinion? What's the follow that? Excellent question. Thank you for that. Studies have shown the vaccine, in fact, gives you higher antibody levels than actually having COVID-19. It stimulates your immune system more. So we are recommending, even if you had have excuse me, even if you have had COVID-19 infection, that you still should get the vaccine. But the timing could be different. It, 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 Reinfection is rare within the first 90 days. So CDC has recommended if you have had COVID-19, it is safe to wait 90 days before you get that vaccine. You're, you're relatively covered by your own antibodies, but after that point, it is recommended that you have the vaccine. It is safe to get the vaccine earlier than that. So if you were infected a month ago and your turn is available and you can get vaccine now, you can certainly, it's certainly safe to take vaccine now. Right. Um, how, if you get the vaccine and you get the disease, are you still, can you still spread it? That's, uh, that is an unknown. So the question is, when you receive vaccine, it might block your system from having symptoms and getting sick, but it is possible that you might get asymptomatic infection and be contagious. We think from the studies that were done that that chance is lower, but not zero. So that's the other reason we are recommending people wear a mask, maintain distance, be careful, even after you receive vaccine to protect others until we can get you know, 70% of adults vaccinated in South Carolina. Yeah, just a couple more on here. How would you explain the importance of this vaccine to teenagers uh, who see so much misinformation across social media? So, and just to reemphasize, the vaccine's not available for those under age 16. Pfizer is approved for 16 and up, uh, but they are working on those studies right now. And I, you know, I would again take turn them to the science. You know that. I think reassuring people is not very helpful. I think that they need to make their own judgment call. And when people look at social media or they hear rumors, I always ask, well, where did you get that information? And if I'm just referred to another social media site, that's not adequate. I want to know, was this studied? Was this published somewhere? Even if I don't understand the technicalities of the publication, I would want, and that's what I would say for teenagers as well. You want to know, was this published in a reputable science journal, or is this just a rumor? Right. And one, one question on here is just for clarification. They say they heard Moderna would protect you from spreading it while Pfizer would not. Is that true? Are you able to choose which vaccine? So uh, what we know is that Moderna tested people. Pfizer didn't initially test people for this. So that's, that's why we know something about Moderna. We don't know something about Pfizer yet. Theoretically, they should, they're so close to each other. Theoretically, they should both be the same. But let me back up for a second. Moderna in those phase three studies also did random nasal swabs on people who weren't having symptoms. It's like you show up your, for your vaccine, they swab your nose, they give you that first dose. And then for Moderna, it's four weeks later. Four weeks later, you come back for your second shot, they swab your nose to see if you had the virus, and then they give you your second vaccine. What they found is that a certain number of people developed you know, had asymptomatic infection during that period of time. They found it on the second swab it was about three times higher among the people who got placebo versus the people who got vaccine. That's why Moderna is able to say their data shows a reduction in transmission. Pfizer didn't do that in their early studies. They are doing it now. They should be about the same. So it's not 100%. There is a reduction. These are really small numbers. So I... I I, to my mind, I would take either vaccine. I, I understand Moderna's got some information that Pfizer doesn't have yet, but Pfizer will have it soon. We don't have a choice yet in South Carolina. Right now, Moderna is all going to long-term care facilities, but we will have a choice in the future. Well, one, one last question. I got several, but let me give you one more question. This is the kind of the million dollar question. Uh, I won't hold you to this, uh, but let me, let me find it here um, uh, on here. It says, given the... Given the intervention measures uh, and the vaccines being practiced, what is your prediction of return to pre-COVID-19 life? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a long time. I, you know, we, we do have vaccine hesitancy. We've been 
suggesting that, uh, that the modeling, you know, when they do epidemiological mathematical models, it suggests that if we could get 70% herd immunity, that uh, that would be protective. But that's, that depends upon a lot of assumptions. It may be higher than that. We might need to get 80% of the population vaccinated. You know, for measles, to suppress a measles outbreak, you have to have 95% of people vaccinated uh, to, to suppress measles. It's not as high, you know, COVID-19 is not as infectious, as contagious as measles, but it's more contagious than influenza. So, you know, it, it may be a, a year or more before things are really back to normal. It depends on how quickly people will uh, agree to be vaccinated. Okay. Well, I'll hold you to that. Hopefully, hopefully you're hopefully not. Yeah. Hopefully not that long, but but um, but we should see we should see some improvement. But you know, it also depends on what you want to call normal. I mean, you know, we can return to a lot of normal functions, like returning kids to school, and you know, once teachers are vaccinated. Um, so you know, it'll be a new normal. Right. Right. Well, Dr. Kelly, thank you for your comments today. And again, thank you for spending an hour with us. I know your schedule is probably uh, pretty full, but we were grateful for your, your time and your expertise. And, and I, think you would, we, I think you said we can email you at any time. If you have any questions, uh, you'll be help, ho hopefully can get back to them as soon as possible, if that's, if that's how you want to handle it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. Great. Thank you. And just so the audience knows, our local hospital system, um, is, is coordinating all of our local distributions uh, sites uh, along with um, some of our private sector. So you can go to our bringingbackthebird.com uh, as that starts to roll out and, and see um, you know, how that distribution is going to work and when it's going to work. So uh, again, thank you for your time today. Uh, again, this is being recorded. Uh, it'll be on our, on our social channels as well. I encourage you to, to send it to uh, your employees or anybody that needs more information about uh, the vaccine, what it is and, and how it works and, and how the distribution uh, will be distributed. So uh, Ethan, thank you for Wells Fargo for uh, our sponsorship today. Our next uh, caffeinated conversation as of right now is scheduled for February the 4th. Uh, more information about that soon. Uh, trust everybody is, will have a, have a great uh, rest of the day and rest of the week and look forward to tuning in uh, with you uh, in a few in a few days. Uh, again, encourage you to go to bringingbackthebird.com if you have any more questions about this program, the vaccine, or any other things that we're doing on your behalf uh, to make sure that your business has all the resources it needs uh, for COVID recovery. Uh, that's all I have and, and have a great day.